Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all beings. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater and athlete who strives to optimize every living ecosystem, passionate about looking after this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that dwell among it. Today is your special monthly paradigm episode where I am joined with my beautiful co-host and at this stage environmental researcher, Shana Harrington. Oh, that's a bit far. Is it really? <laughs> I mean, I've seen what you've been posting on your stories. It's a lot of environmental oh. research. It's activism in one way and many others. It's just sharing information that's already out there. Journals. <laughs> I would not go that far. Um, there's a lot we got planned this episode. We're changing the structure of the show, which is super exciting. So we're adding two different sound effects uh-huh. um, to be super fancy. Um, so we decided to bring more structure to the episode so we can bring more value and more depth to the topics that we do talk about. So each episode will have two specific topics, where we or one or two, sorry, where we both do our own deep dives and then any other relevant news stories and studies and also we finish up on good news and a sustainability tip um just so you know we're in for before you even click onto the episode to make sure it's what you want to spend your time listening to and learning about how's that sound sounds excellent i reckon so today we're talking about two specific things um but more specifically we're actually at uluru right now we are in uluru it's bloody hot isn't it yeah it's a bit warm for uh Winter time, mm. um, top 26 today and just bouldering hot sun. Just pelts down on you. Mm. But the sites are pretty beautiful. Obviously, you've got Uluru itself. We've got Katajuda and then up to Kings Canyon. You liking it all? Love it. We did the base walk today, which is what, about just under 12Ks yeah. in total. It was mm. supposed to be about 10. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a hot one. It was good, though. Yeah. Except the water here, hmm, questionable. Yeah, the water here is um, it's pretty yuck. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, and it's before as we first tried it. Not to we, sugarcoat not it. Not to sugarcoat <laughs> it. When we first tried it, we're like, "What is the taste in this water?" And mm. then the day after it, a news a news article came out of the Guardian about a town that's close to here. You got Alice Springs, and about 200 kilometers north, there's this town that's predominantly an Aboriginal Australian population and they have three times a safe drinking level of uranium in their water and there's no laws in the northern territory to tackle issues like this it's really horrible so bad and i feel like we're tasting that and we would i think we've spoken about michigan before Mm. and we're just like that could never happen in australia yet it is 100 percent is like three times the level of uranium that's insane because I, I know there's a lot of mines and stuff out here and it just yeah. gets polluted into the water streams, which is incredibly And we've seen that in Tasmania, as we mentioned last episode. Mm. It was the last episode? Yeah, last episode. Yeah, yeah. with the, the water stream just being bright orange. Like, that's, yeah, that is not okay. No, definitely not. But, yeah, we haven't hit Hallis Springs yet, um, but there actually looks like a few good dining options up there. Yeah, yeah, there are a fair bit of vegan options, which you wouldn't mm. expect in mm. the middle of Australia. Like even Kubapedi had a few, that vegan marked on a menu one place did, yeah. which is like 50% Yay. of the restaurants. So <laughs> it's insane how far widespread veganism as a topic really is, even mm. in populations where you have, what, 2,600 residents or whatever. I it think was it was in, like 1,600 in yeah, Kubapedi. even less. So it's awesome to see that you can travel into the centre of Australia and still be okay. Not that Ayers Rock has incredible <laughs> options. We've been able to have chips. Yeah, we missed out on the rice paper rolls. They closed. Yeah, but other than that, just IGA. Mm. Just got to go to the supermarket and do your own cooking and stuff. Cook our own stuff. That's good. Which is fine. Um, but one of the big topics we'll be talking about today is labour. So in the... Sorry for those not in Australia or not interested in Australian politics. So if you're international... Bear with us. We're going to be talking about politics a fair bit on the episode. So we recently had an election, which was decided last week. Five days ago. Five days ago (laughs) as we were recording this, and Labor won. So Labor is your progressives, and we had the Liberal, which is a conservative party, which was running Australia for nine years 
prior to that. So Labour is like a slight centre to left, um, just for some context there. But they won the election and also a lot of Greens uh, seats, which Greens are very good for like um, animal justice and climate change and, and all of that. And a lot of independent parties, which is people who are coming in and have their own, they, they can be essentially very hard to sway by lobbyists. So they they represent communities very well. So this is great news for climate change. Uh, not the best news for climate change. Ideally, the best news would be the, like the Greens winning, which we might be a few elections away from that happening. <laughs> That's hopeful. Um, but there's a lot we're going to be talking about as to n- now that Labor has won and Australia is going to be under Labor's guidance. For, is it four years? The election three. Like three years. So it's going to be three years of guidance. Now, what can we kind of expect is what I want to dive into for this episode. So we chose to look at Labor's victory in this election and what that means for the environment. So that's what you can expect us to kind of go into for a fair bit. But before that, just a bit on a personal note, um, I've managed to find a way to drink some pretty good coffee on the road, haven't I? Woohoo! What's your dream? My dream, because, you know, everyone loves a Brewster coffee, but at this stage... Well, almost everybody. Almost everyone. You don't like coffee. It's well known. Um, You know, it's $6, $7 to get this Brewster coffee, so I wanted to find a way to tackle this and travel at the same time. So, luckily, our friends at Four Sigmatic hooked us up with some French press ground coffee which is awesome. So on the road, I just pop a few spoons in, get some boiling water in there, bang, black coffee with some ashwagandha, some reishi, some lion's mane mushroom to increase, I guess, plant points, but fungi points. Yeah, do they count? I think they count. Surely they count. Have to ask Dr. B about that. (laughs) So we are officially affiliated with Four Sigmatic, which is super exciting because I've had their products for quite a while, even Years before now. before we got together. I would bring their um, coffees and hot chocolates into work. Adaptogen, my yeah, the mm. adaptogens. I used to bring it all in and just have it as my coffee because it's like it tasted so much better than some of the Brewster coffees around there. So yeah, and you'd get so upset when they would get burnt. So this way, this won't happen. That's right, it won't happen. <laughs> so for anyone looking to try out some Four Sigmatic coffee or hot chocolate or protein, I've even been trying out their protein in my smoothies, which is great. You're smashing the protein. Absolutely. Chuck in code PLANT10 to save 10% off your order, which is awesome. And I'll also leave a link in the show notes below for you to get that. And that's international. So I like them because it can be Australian, you can be from the US, Europe, UK. Perfect. Doesn't matter. And you can be living in a van as well. And you can be, it is van friendly. <laughs> that is right. Which is awesome. And of course, they're all vegan, um, which is which is a given. And haven't you had the co-founder on? No. So, yeah. So, oh. hopefully in the future, I'll have the co-founder on to have a bit of a chat. Oh, he's, he's doing a book tour soon. So, I'm trying to tee that up to get some more mushroom talk going over, over here. Love that. Yeah. What else has been happening? Well, we visited a lot of wedding venues, didn't we? In the oh, last wow. month. Yeah. It's probably about 10, would you say? Yeah, 10 or 12, something mm. like that. Only one of them hasn't been able to cater for us having a full vegan wedding. Mm. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I agree. I, I was expecting a lot more of an issue, but yeah. generally or speaking, like it's extra like... extra costs or anything like that, which we haven't found at all. No extra costs with any of them. Is it with none of them? No. Oh, I thought there was maybe one of them, but that's no. that's incredible. Yeah. And a lot of them are actually saying, oh, we've had vegan weddings here before. Yeah. Something that's becoming more popular. Probably about two of the venues have been able to give us a sample menu, which has been amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, one of them just flat out was no. No. They? Yeah, there was like, nope, can't do it. I was like, what? But you can. You, you can. just won't. Lazy, lazy buggers. Why would they not? Mm. I don't know. Vegan food's cheaper and you charge us the same price. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, what well, else did we do? We went to the vegan market. The big vegan market. That was so much food. We what was your favourite? Uh, future sushi. I think that was my favourite too. Yeah, there's this. They're out of Collingwood in, yeah. in Melbourne and or in Victoria, should I say. I think they're just opening there. Oh, they've been there for a while oh. as like caterers, I think, for events. But now they're... F- Officially, I think, opening a store, so Future Sushi. On the 3rd of June, so when this comes out, it'll be open. No, not sponsored by them. No. Just, 
Just go and check them out. So delicious. Mm. I had the duck. Yeah, there was duck. There was your favorite was the lobster or the the crab. crab, Yeah, yeah, which was just fascinating. The flavors that they can create. Um, There was so much ice cream. And desserts and cookies and macaron and we got Donuts, heaps of cheeses. Yeah, fine yeah. cultures, shout out. Yeah. Oh, so yum. Yeah, heaps of amazing vegan. Like, it just, there's so many vegans in Melbourne though. Either you've got to be vegan or at least plant curious to go to an event that's called the For Big sure. Vegan Market. For sure. Um, the food is just incredible. And there were a lot of amazing other vendors like clothes and mm. Animal Justice Party was there and, yeah. and lots of other things, which was awesome to see and eat. <laughs> we had some taste testing of some uh, alcohol, mm. everything. Yeah, it was great. Should we get into the episode? Let's do it. Labor wins the 2022 Australian election. The new Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has promised to turn Australia into a renewable energy superpower and end, in quotes, the climate wars that have hampered progress for years. So it sounds like a pretty good start. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of promises that he's putting forward. And of course, it is politics. Promises don't stand up as well as you know, a pinky promise with your best friend. Yeah. That, they are solid. They are solid. <laughs> but, yeah, we can't we can't take this as gospel. Mm. It is a promise, um, like, to get your vote, really, yeah. isn't it? So Pretty much. what are they promising us? They're promising us a lot. And, and just before we get into the promises, oh, I've got sorry. to mention a few things. So he's actually had congratulations pretty much all across the board. So we had Joe Biden meet him the other day with, with – heaps of good notes with the climate change. And one that really stuck out to me is the Fiji um, leader, Frank, and I'm not going to pronounce his surname. It's quite long. Um, He actually tweeted out, congratulations, Albo, of your many promises to support the Pacific. None is more welcome than your plan to put climate first. Our people's shared future depends on it. So I think that's very powerful in Australia as a nation to really take this seriously and under this new leadership to to take that opportunity to get back in the good books because we really haven't been, you've heard us rant a few times in the past, but... um, About good old ScoMo. Good old ScoMo. Um, But here are a few promises that they have made. So firstly, an additional, actually, I had a, I found a really cool reference before I get into into carbonbrief.org. Okay. So what they had is this big table with the Liberal, the Nationals, the Greens, and Labor, and they put 26 categories of of environmentally related topics, and they put each target's policy or plan on that particular topic. So it was actually really cool, and I'll leave that linked in the show notes. So I won't read all 26, but what we can expect from Labor, what they've promised, is a 43% of total emissions reduced by 2030, which is much better than the previous plan of 26%, so almost double. Um, inc- well, it was fifteen percent increase. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, which is amazing. Mm. Not great. No. I mean, I'd still expect way more. I want. Well, this is working towards net zero by twenty fifty. Mm. We can't click our fingers and change it overnight. It's there. At least there's a plan in place. Mm. We hope. We hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, well, their plan to get that is mainly leaning on renewables as as yeah, an industry. Definitely. So they're planning to increase renewables by 83%. And essentially their way to do that is to get more solar on roofs, so a lot more roof solar, um, and they're doing that with a $200 million subsidy. Um, and I think you'll like this next one. They're actually looking to focus a lot on an electric car, electric cars in total. So they're investing $251 million to help buyers by removing inefficient taxes from low emission vehicles. Amazing. So we're finally going to get slightly cheaper electric cars, yes. which is which is something that has been holding out a lot of buyers from from that industry. Well, they have a like a strategy out for it, the National Electric Vehicle Strategy. Yes. So that it's just a huge. Well, we don't know what the discount's going to be, mm. but there will be some, some sort discount. Of discount. They're looking to install four hundred community batteries across the country. It's insane. Of course, we know that. With every solution comes with another problem, and we know batteries have their own problems, mm-hmm. but yep. we 
it is still a step in the right direction. They're looking to create 640,000 jobs with this. That's insane. Huge. Yeah. Because really, it's so it's so funny. Was that 64,000, 640,000? 604,000. That's insane. Because I remember during the pre-election, like we're talking January, February, we've talked about this before, but Murdoch Media essentially tried to get liberals on another term because they subsidize fossil fuels quite a bit. And so there was that ad in the newspaper, and I'll try to find it. I forgot what exactly it said, but net zero by 2050 will... will remove 150,000 jobs from the Australian economy. economy this is yep. what they touted as, oh, no, if you elect this um, leader that doesn't want as many fossil fuels, which, and we'll get into it, Labor still does, but they're saying this 150,000 figure, which is probably completely made up, oh, compared pulled out to of a hat. Let's, your figure, mm. 600,000 jobs. Like, that's look, insane. I'm not saying that these are going to be new jobs. People no. will likely lose. Yes, correct. They're going to transition. There will be studying involved. There will be, uh, you know, lots of um, ways to incorporate them into the new renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is awesome. So, um, yeah, people don't need to be afraid of transitioning. No. That's, that's the main God, key no. here. And I think, you know, when we talk about veganism especially, it's like, we're not saying we should just ditch the farmers and leave them out to be. Like, these Absolutely. people need transitions. Like, if I read the Greens policy in preparation for this, and what I found fascinating is they had a, a $10 million plan to just sh retrain every single worker that's got to do with fossil fuels and give whoever hires them a subsidy. Amazing. Like yeah. Just, if you take this worker on, we'll pay the difference. Yeah. Take him on, and they guarantee your salary for 10 years. Wow. Oh, that's what they would promise and implement yes but it's like these it, it's not when when people say oh i want to remove coal and mining industry people think oh you want to strip the people from these jobs it's not yeah, about that th i guess they feel personally excuse me they feel personally attacked because their job is on the line for this 100 percent. so and, that's, that's I, and you case. understand it but yeah you should just be open to another career path why 100%. not why not try something new? If you, especially if you're in talks of getting the exact same pay, correct. And now you can contribute to a future that your children can live in. Yeah, a cleaner future. Mm -hmm. Well, along with this initiative, they're looking at cutting power bills for families and businesses by two hundred and seventy-five dollars a year by twenty twenty-five. Mm -hmm. So that's by the time the end end of term. Yeah, yep. and that's that's compared to today. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. That's Cheaper, good. renewable, cleaner, greener. Definitely. That That's really, really awesome that they're kind of looking at that. But I, I will note, um, look, he's, he's come out and people have caught him say, well, at Albanese I'm referring to, mm -hmm. that he is actually open to new minds. If okay. they are, and in his quotes, environmentally sound. Which, is that a cop-out? Because they're not going yeah. to be. Is yeah, that his it, it way is. of, I don't know, well, sidestepping that? Look, the, the Liberal government really play, and a lot of fossil fuel companies pay on, play on this like carbon capture system, which mm. is untested, and they kind of tout on, no, whatever carbon leaves, we'll, we'll sequester it, we'll, we'll plant trees, which they buy back like carbon credits from other companies. Yeah. And it's just, it's just not enough. Um, so, and the reason that he's saying this is there was actually a, a local election in 2019, I can't remember exactly where it was, but they had a plan that said they're not they're going to open no new fossil fuel operations they lost the election by a landslide really? so i think it's them playing safe just to get the the vote the in, vote in. Yeah. so prior they did say no new ones and now after three years it's, it's completely different but if he's saying if it's viable environmentally which we know it's not going to be then that's where he can kind of be like oh i can't do it Correct. Not environmentally friendly. It's so true. So I hope that will happen, especially with a lot of seats, like we said at the beginning, going to the Greens and to the Independents. They can really focus on that. Mm. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of systems like carbon capture and like the safeguard um, emission scheme, which we can talk a little bit about later. But um, what else did you have kind of noted on the labour and how that can impact our environment? Well, they're looking at protecting the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge. We know that the Great Barrier Reef is just an enormous ecosystem. It's 
huge for our um, tourism. Like, really, Queensland's tourism huge. depends on the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. And so do a, a lot of species. So um, it's currently on the in danger list for the World Heritage Committee. Mm-hmm. Right. And as you mentioned last episode, it's just getting worse and worse. It's not getting better. So Labor plans to invest nearly $1.2 billion into the reef's preservation and restoration by 2030. Mm-hmm. I want to I wanna give a pretext to this because I saw that number and I was like, I was really stoked with that. And I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but it like actually wasn't Labor in a majority. It was actually Liberal. So Liberal voted to give it $1 billion dollars January this year. So once they found out the Great Barrier Reef is in danger and UNESCO wanted to jump in and help out and they didn't want that. So Susan Lee flew all around Europe and didn't want, like, it was a crazy, big, stupid thing. But they they pledged $1 billion over the course, I think, up until 20... 2030. Was it 2030? I think so. Yeah, Labor jumped in and said, we're going to pop another 200 million Mm. on top of that. Which, again, that's still a win. Um, But I... But now that... Labor's in government, they could have cut that funding. Very so true. So it's, it's, you know, it might be, I think we still need to give them credit here. Yeah. Credit where credit's due. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Liberal would have actually executed Well, that's exactly that. that's right. The, that's the question and I would we have. we still don't know that Labor, Labor will. will. That's so right. So we, we're going to keep an eye on it for sure. Yeah. Well, I think the main context of this episode is n- we're not saying Labor, yeah, Labor, because it's not about that. It's This is what we can expect from the government. Or this is what we hope to this expect. This is what we hope to expect. We yeah. have to keep them accountable. Like whether it's Labor or Liberal, we're holding them accountable to, to whatever they promise when they promise. Yeah. Um, because I, I am hopeful for the Great Barrier Reef because in the election uh, campaign, Albanese actually went and visited, I think it was Fitzroy Island, Nice. And he actually saw what was happening there, which is why he promised that additional amount because he went and said what they plan on doing with the reef. Yeah. Um, but that, that funding can do a lot. Oh, huge. Well, they claim to protect the turtles, dugongs, dolphins from threats including plastic pollution, egg predators, illegal poaching and accidental take. Mm-hmm. I don't quite know Accidental how. Accidental take. I don't know. I'm not sure what. Like, I suppose if you're just roaming around, you know, like, oh, just, I'm going to take that. Okay. I don't know how. I do not know how they're going to look at plastic pollution, how they're going to stop yeah. egg pred- like predators. That's it's very, natural. So, very. Yeah, bl- it's a bit blasé. So yeah. I- I'm not sure. Um, they're also looking at working with the fishing industry to, to ensure sustainable fishing sector. Okay. Which we know kind of doesn't really exist yeah. either. So well, um, I don't know what that entails. Um, I'd really love to know their plan. Yeah, I, I didn't see that fishing sector, which, but it kind of reminded me of what was that Pacific Ocean or Pacific Blue with the Sylvia Earle documentary mm. on Netflix, where she went out to the Great Barrier Reef for a, a spot that she was a few years prior and just had no fish. Nothing. Nothing. And she's like, fishing is meant to be illegal here, but somehow there's just nothing. Um, but what I, what I find really fascinating about the 1.2 billion that set, and when we're talking money in this episode, it's Australian dollars, of course. Um, almost half of that, just over half of that, actually, is mainly going to be focusing on fertilizer runoffs and real time water management systems. So yeah. this is something that is not even it, it's the it's the farmers, yeah, really in the area, and. I assumed just with my own bias that it was animal agriculture, but I was wrong. Oh. Um, what do you think they farm the most of in tropical North Queensland? Sugar cane. That's right, sugar cane. So it's sugar cane that's really damaging with the fertilizers that actually go into the water. So the way that I understand it, and this plan hasn't been solidified, so there's not too many, too much details on it, but they're going to implement a system with an app. So the app can manage all the water so they can see, okay, they're not meant to water it here where their fertilizer is going to run off because of the rain. So it's going to be a very in-depth Bureau of Meteorology app mixed with when their fertilizer is going out, how much. Because what happens and why this is really dangerous is when the fertilizer jumps into the ocean or rolls into the ocean. Jumps um, in. Jumps in like we do. um, It it's a nitrogen compound. So what happens is dangerous algal blooms, as we've seen across Miami, which we've talked about, or Florida in general, mm-hmm. which we've talked about in a previous episode, and that um, that grows a particular species, which is the 
Crown of Thorns starfish. Mm. Um, and these starfish essentially just destroy vast amounts of coral and pose a huge threat to the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, the algal blooms themselves can also reduce the amount of light available required for seagrasses to grow and be healthy. So that, again, reduces the food source for these dugongs, the turtles, yeah. and the species that you mentioned earlier. Yes, they are implementing or expanding the Crown of Thorns culling program. Mm. But I just wonder if that's just like hurting an ecosystem to help another. Mm. It's, it's fascinating. It, it's out of balance. Mm. That's all it is. It it's, is. You know, it's really strange. It's like in some parts of Victoria, they have like the wild pig epidemic where the council is actually having to cull these wild pigs because it's out of balance. Yeah. Because the farmers kill the dingoes, or other predators to protect their farmland. And then you've just completely ruined this ecosystem. Yeah, it's really sad. It. It's just It just hurts me to think that other animals or other sea life are getting culled just to save another. And it's like, well, mm. one day are those going to be on the endangered list when we've been culling them. Yeah. I don't know. It's insane. So it, it doesn't sound very sustainable action, but I'm glad to hear that they have some idea of what they're going to do with the Great Barrier Reef. Because yeah. it is in dying need, like we spoke about last episode. It's gone through its um, sixth major bleaching in the past seven years. Four of them had occurred and 91% of the coral um, coast of the Great Barrier Reef had bleaching occur. Some died and some will hopefully recover. We won't know for some time, though. We won't know for some time. Well, they are going on the Great Barrier Reef. They're implementing advanced research into thermotolerant corals oh, to help climate adaption. So is that kind of like biotech? Don't comes? ask me any more about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> That's all I know. Um, in partnership with the Australian Institute, Institute of Marine Science. Okay. Another way they are looking at protecting the Great Barrier Reef is having indigenous ranges. Mm. So we've seen that around Uluru. Everywhere you go, there were ranges and they were all indigenous. So they yep. know the land, you know, 100%. it's been passed down from their ancestors. So it is really great to see that they're playing on their strengths. Yeah, So they're, they're investing quite a bit there for the reef preservation and restoration. 100%. I, I really want to see more um, implementation of the Indigenous owners of this land, the original owners of this land, to really take care of the land because they know, like when we're at the um, LaRue Centre to backtrack to where we are now, it had like one of the texts on the top as we walk through said, you know, we're in talks all the time with, with scientists, with biologists about about the land, about the predators, what they eat, where they stay, where you can find these animals, when they Their lay. cycle, they, yeah. Everything. Like these indigenous, they know because they've passed down that knowledge. Like we've been here for 200 years. They've been here for thousands. Why would we not Hundreds want, of thousands. Why would we like, not want to take advantage of that information to help preserve our environment, mm. their environment? So I'm stoked. I did read about that and I'm really stoked about that as well. Yeah, it is a, it is a huge plus. Mm-hmm. But going on with our waters, yeah. the next promise is regarding urban rivers and catchments. Right, okay. They will provide grants for community groups, local and state government, mm -hmm. to, provide, uh, to fund projects which will deliver improvements to water quality and the local environments, which is good news. Great news. So, following on with water. Seems very blasé. Yeah. No specific dollar amount or anything, but Look, seems pretty. Um, there like a isn't idea. a dollar amount, I don't believe. Um, and you know what? I think the most thorough of all these promises have been the first one that we mentioned the Powering Australia promise. Yeah. Yeah. There was a full plan. Like, if you, yeah. if you go to Labor's website, you might even link it in the show notes. Yeah, sure. There was a huge plan. Where some of the other ones, I was, it was just really a bit, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Well, but, I think they have to be prepared with that kind of stuff because they had just gone to the Quad Summit. They're, you know, got the COP27 mm -hmm. coming up and they have to be prepared to go in guns blazing because we've been an absolute embarrassment and went with an oil uh, giant last year, Angus Taylor. So we didn't, <laughs> we've been making an absolute fool of ourselves as a nation. So I can understand why they would put such a big emphasis on that. Yeah. Um, again, are they putting too many eggs in one basket? I'm not sure. 
because on their plan to that 43% reduction, it's we're looking at purely renewable energies. Yep. If we dialed down the coal mining, we wouldn't have to rely so much on that. Is that something they'll look in the future? I bloody hope so. And look, reducing the uh, our emissions to forty by forty three percent is going to automatically help the rivers and catchments. Hundred automatically, it's yep. there's no question about that. So there, this is already a problem because we've been treating our rivers as like what stormwater drains. Yeah. Over the last few years. Kind of like what oceans had for a long time where you could just dump anything, anything in an ocean. Because when you dump it in a river, it's there for ten seconds and the stream takes it down. Takes it and it will just end up in the ocean anyway. 100. Or into our water catchments. Mm-hmm. So which, you know, is also really bad. Yeah. And so that's a hundred percent because we know that a lot of the uh, rubbish and litter that ends up in the ocean starts from river streams. Mm-hmm. So we do not treat our rivers with the amount of respect needed. No. And a few ways they plan to fix this problem Mm -hmm. is by educating the young. So preschoolers and school-aged children. So they're getting scientists in at schools. Um, They're removing uh, cement walls and returning them to natural riverbanks. Awesome. So that's going to build habitats and... Allow animals to come in and and lay Make ecosystems back again instead of there being cement. It's, you know, what um, mud rivers, sand rivers. This is all... Mm. (laughs) This is natural for a reason. Yeah. They lay eggs in these in this sand. It's just yeah, it's it's an ecosystem that we've completely destroyed. So we're going to just um, change that and they're going to be planting heaps of more trees around the habitats. So obviously I'm guessing that's a lot to do with koala. Yeah. Which right. they have got promises about koalas and stuff as well. So I hope so. They've been really decimated due to the uh, recent fires and, and I'm lack I'm not sure. L- lack of yeah. care is a good way to <laughs> good way to put it. Well, I was actually gonna bring up WA for a second. So Western Australia. Um well, look- I can go on about koalas if you want. Oh, if you can talk about koalas, yeah. that would be incredible. So They've also got a program about saving native species. Yeah. Something I learned from looking into this, might need fact checking, I'm not sure, <laughs> but apparently Australia is the worst mammal, has the worst mammal extinction rate in the world, which honestly doesn't surprise me. Oh, well, you think about Tasmanian tiger. Mm. We had the ringtail molasses up in Queensland go extinct. I'm sh- there's a few endangered species in WASA. Not surprised at all. The cassowary, I'm not sure where they are on that list, but I'm... Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's a few that are just in abundance, mm. like kangaroos, cockatoos. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> That's it. But there's a lot of them. And magpies. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but there are like quail, which or quoll, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I believe they're also on the endangered list, little fox-looking things. Yeah, we definitely do not treat our animals very well at all. Yeah. It's a deforestation. Um, oh, like- exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So this program isn't just focusing on animals, but mm-hmm. it's focusing on plants as well, which is awesome. really exciting. That's really exciting. You know, these are plants that have been around for millions of years that we just don't take care of, but the Aboriginal people would just, yeah. Um, know how to maintain that balance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of the focus is on koalas here. Good. Because if we don't do something now, they're likely to be extinct in 30 years. Really? Yeah. That's how horrendous. Obviously, you've got to think about in 30 years, if we're not taking action, bushfires will be mm, higher. Ever, ever worse. Flooding will be more. And that's when habitats will be ruined. And we just, we've just we seen the images of koalas in bushfires before. Oh, it's heart-wrenching. Isn't it? Mm, and so, you just think of this plush toll toy, this beautiful thing so that a lot cute. of us had growing up. In, even that iconic little koala that you put on your pen, yes. which I'm sure a lot of people can remember it. And you have this icon, and it's it's so strange. We do that with kangaroos too. We slaughter them en masse. Yep. And you wouldn't think about this with koalas, but now there's... Just so much need for koala adoption centers, care centers, Mm -hmm. rehabilitation centers. It's just, it's an abomination. And that's what Labor's promised to work on. So they're expanding koala hospitals and services, investing in vaccines and fertility programs, Mm -hmm. boosting protection. I believe it was about uh, $225 spent towards this program. 
Wow. Okay. So we hear these big numbers. I know. And so like 1.2 billion on the reef. You, you got 220 on electric cars. 200 on this. And I guess that's why people are concerned about the budget with Labor mm. because it, it does it it is spending a lot more than what the Liberal government plans to and people are worried about where this money's coming from but to be completely honest if there is no environment what are you working for yeah you if you've got no future yeah this is where we need to invest the money it's so funny um on that list i was talking about before on on climatebrief.org um under the greens 1.5 policy um they said at over 1.5 there's no society so what is this question about again? Yeah. And it's just like, that's so, like, what do you mean 1.5? Like, and it's up for debate. And yeah. it's just so confusing because there is no debate. Mm. It's we've reached this number or nothing. Like, I'm yeah. grateful that I feel like the rhetoric has changed a little bit from climate denial to climate avoidal. Well, now bit. we'll just need Murdoch media to. Yeah. To kind of lean on. But. Yeah. You can't. No. You can't. Do you have more about koalas? Nothing. Koalas, Nothing more about but... koalas? Okay, that's a shame. <laughs> um, I want to talk about coal and gas for a second before we talk more about um, labour. Well, this is kind of a labour thing. So mm -hmm. WA, Western Australia, will have to change the most with the emission plan because they account for about a third of Australian emissions. I'm surprised. But now that I think, think about it. Think of all the it... coal and power plants coal and, and fossil fuel frackers, all of that's like that yeah. WA coast. Well, what and they would also have an abundance of farms and cattle. Cattle farms, all your sheep exports, all your yeah. cattle exports, that's WA. So a lot of farmland there. So they create as much CO2 as Sweden. So that's a good way to think of it. Wow. Although still, it doesn't look that impressive because Sweden's tiny, tiny. and WA is huge, humongous. but it's so barren. Looking at the population alone, it doesn't make sense because Sweden, I believe, has more population than Australia. Oh, I'd imagine. This is just one state. Yeah. Talking a few million people to share the big big land. So, so this is coming back to the safeguard mechanism I mentioned much earlier. So... There's this scheme called the safeguard mechanism, and it's very fascinating. It's like, I'm trying to think of a really good example. So, an antibiotic resistance in Australia, at the moment, there's very little regulation. So, what they're trying to do is they're trying to give these cattle farmers and these other farmers, they say, okay, here you go. Here's the tool necessaries, necessary to check um, antibiotic resistance, make sure you're doing safe practice, do it at your leisure. Now, take that same principle and methodology and apply it to fuel. So, they've got this safeguard mechanism where you have, this is the amount of CO2 you're allowed to admit. That is, this is your safeguard. Now, don't go above that and you're okay. Mm -hmm. Who gets to choose that? They do. <laughs> so, they choose their safeguard. Now, this th there, is a, there is a small third party as well that does aggregate with them, but it is all dependent on the reports they submit to them. Right. So how much CO2, how much fracking, how much did you exude from the ground last fin year or whatever year, report that to us and we will create a safeguard in conjunction with something we both agree on. So yep. this all depends on their own reporting, which we know can be skewed. And I'm not saying all <laughs> of them do skew it. I'm sure a lot, a lot do. And look, there's... And, <laughs> I need to do the math on this because there's some companies, I forgot which one, there's nine really big ones, like Shell's on there, Chevron is a huge one in WA. There's one on there saying they essentially buy back their credits as well to stay under that. So they can go over that safeguard, but because they buy carbon credits back from like planting trees, that can then fall under. But right. they've still extracted heaps. So they're... they're their unit is only CO2 emissions. So we should be looking at gross rather than... Correct. Yeah. 100%. Because you can... They've got this huge... I think it was like a 40 hectare property where one of these companies planted 3,000 trees. Incredible. How much did you extrude from the ground to have to plant 3,000 trees mm. that will carbon offset in 40 years when the trees fully Correct. grow? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think that's a real issue, but that's a bit of a tangent. So... Where did that come from even? Because if we're not, if the Labor Party's not promising on any kind of reduction here, that 
is a that is ready to collapse in the next few years before even Labor has to leave. Because there's that three year term that they've got that's gonna need a change. And there's no promise that they actually can do there. Mm. Um so I'm hoping that there's third party signs that they're going to have some sort of advisory team to the government, which kind of leans into where I'm going with this whole long winded point. So this is actually really fascinating. I'm sure it'll fascinate a lot of people. And Australia, this is not unique to Australia. We stole this idea. So the Labor Party has promised to establish a parliamentary office of science, which is modelled on the one in the UK, which is to provide independent scientific advice to the parliament. So this is not funded by any industry. This is not funded by any third party, no brand, no business, no company, purely by the government. And it's, it's not a small amount of money. We're talking 3% of the GDP. Wow. To go purely on researching to topics like climate change, agriculture, um, business, steel, mining, anything, independent science, pure. Now, the Greens are arguing for 4%, mm -hmm. um, which is what a lot of the scientists want as well, that grants and things like that, so they can study health, longevity, these kinds of topics that we, we love in, for health. But 3% of GDP... It's a start. It's a start. And I'm hoping that these independent scientists will then kind of expand. This is what WA is doing to further my rant. Mm. And this is what Vic's doing. This is what SA is doing. This is their trajectory. Without having a business or fossil fuel like the CSI IRO, which is funded sometimes by these companies. So I'm really stoked about that. And I'm really happy that Labor has thought about that specific because I never had thought about something like that. But mm. incredible, incredible. Well, they've also implemented an – well, promised to implement an environmental law reform. reform. Mm -hmm. So, Labor will establish an independent environmental protection agency. So, again, completely independent. Yeah. And awesome. it's going to have two divisions. One, a compliance and assurance division. Two, an environmental data, info and analysis division. That sounds great. Right, so I'm unsure if this is if this info will be accessible by the public. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure like right. what goes on there or if it's just their internal. Um, but yeah, that would be amazing if we could. And then with another promise, I don't know if I don't know if this is actually a promise because I couldn't find this on their website, but mm -hmm. I found it on the Guardian. Thirty percent by 2030. What thirty percent of what? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more, quick. Tell me more. Labor has promised to protect 30% of land and 30% of sea areas by 2030. Wow. That's incredible. Again, I couldn't find this on their website. I what did, the, did you check what the Guardian linked to at all? No. Sometimes they don't. Um, yeah, see. Sometimes it, like an exclusive interview and they can't link to a source or a video, mm, which is. Secret so, source. Yeah, secret so source. I'm not sure about that, but that would be, yeah, really incredible. Agreed. So let's talk sheep for a second. Tell me about sheep. The Australia. So we talked about WA with their exports. So sheep in particular is the industry is worth ninety two million dollars a year to Australia. So it's quite a big part of our export and our GDP. Now Labor has come out and said they want this to stop. They're trying to phase it out. Um, WA is obviously hugely against that um, because it is a big. It's a decent part of their economy. Mm. Like when we're looking at cattle. And sheep together, it gives them two billion dollars wow. per year. So, it, it is quite a lot of money. They do not survive on tourism. <laughs> no, God no. Um, look, but the fact that sheep can come out of this and hopefully get phased out, there's no official plan. Um, obviously, they've, the the sheep export in particular have their own lobbying group that are trying to get that inundated and, and just completely cancelled but labor has come out and said they want to phase phase this out and they they Great. said that last election as well in 2019 yep um so i'm really hoping that this slow i'm sure it's not high on their agenda which is a shame because i i don't want to go in into the ethics of it but i'm sure we can understand being on a boat for days months weeks like it's it's not a pleasant experience um especially with without sunlight food then it's not going on a cruise like when we go no. for a cruise it's it's a you know it's a prison yeah so to have this kind of start to get phased out which is i'm really stoked with that i don't see their cattle exporting industry getting phased out anytime soon um but i'm hoping that it i was is wondering start. why is it such a focus on sheep 
because it's the smallest. Yeah. <laughs> like we're talking 92 million compared to 2 billion dollars, yeah. which is mainly due to cattle. So Labor have actually come out and said they don't want to make a change to the cattle. Okay. Uh, at least, yeah. No, I don't see them wanting to make a tr- uh, change. That's more of a Greens policy. So the Greens would want to kind of start to get out of that yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah. We're all for that. All for that, ideally. Um, and we haven't really talked about politics too much on the show. It's usually ranting. So well, previously. I was previ- going to say, um, previ- this has been uh, all episode. Politics. No, previously we haven't really. So here we're kind of being a bit transparent with who you can obviously guess we vote for or support, at least in terms of Labor or Liberal. Um, of course, I just want to mention again with Merit, we know no party is perfect and, and we understand everyone has different ideologies. And, and I don't think we've put our political views forward at no. all. I think we're just saying these are the promises, this is what, and we're happy about those promises. Yeah. Obviously, we're not happy with how the last decade have gone under the no. Liberal government. So, yeah. And that's evident. No one should be happy in an environmental aspect mm. with how the last decade has gone no. for Australia. Honestly, it's actually actually embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. You've yep. got sexually assaulted women. Mm. You've got absolutely no change to climate change. We've become we've, – our unemployment's gone – gotten worse. Like, we've had no wins, really, no. in the past nine years. So we're just very excited, which is why this episode <laughs> is, is featured on what they can promise because we've got a little bit of hope here. Um, if the Liberal government did get re-elected, um, this would just be an hour, hour-long hour rant, I think. <laughs> well, I think we would do the same thing. We'd go through their promises, but it would go for five minutes instead yeah. of... <laughs> they promised. Okay, thanks for yeah, coming to the it, show. That's <laughs> it. So I've got a few more promises that Labor have come with. Let's do it. So they're promising to... Look, and when I said before, this one is probably the least detailed promise okay. that I found on their website. So I'm not holding I'm not holding my eggs in this basket for this. But it's about the oceans and marine parks. The okay. initiative seems to be in, in like in combination with the rivers and okay. the Great Barrier Reef commitment. Yeah. I feel like the Great Barrier Reef is definitely getting a lot more funding than this, mm. but I believe it was about $4 million that would be divided up between the states and territories to help manage current marine parks. And that's honestly probably just going to help with the backlog that they were not getting support before. Mm, so I think that's just to help them stay afloat. So yep. I don't see too much changing there. Um, but Labor will work with the states to protect breeding and feeding grounds as a priority. Yeah. They've mentioned that they will consider a framework that addresses the importation of seafood from fisheries that include illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. Oh, fascinating. We've, we've talked about that on the show. So yeah. I'm excited to see how that unfolds for them and how they're really going to categorise all these. And we know how easy it is just to get that tick of approval. Mm. So I feel, and also Labor's wording was, we are considering a framework. Yeah. So I get Wording is important, yeah. you know, especially when we're talking politics. Yeah, so I feel like there's not a lot of substance there. Yeah. Um, because we just know how corrupt it is. Yeah. The feel of the fisheries and, 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 and how it just can't be policed. It can't be regulated. Yeah. So that's that. And then Labor have come out and established that we have a waste crisis. This, this, you're looking at me dumbfounded. I think this is good news. Like, pay, like I just, it's common sense, but I'm just like, they've come out and said it. Great. <laughs> You didn't know? Uh, I think this is good. Oh, it's great. Because... What kind of waste are they talking about there? Everything. So, recycling, like, just production. We just have too much. Landfill is getting too full, all of this. Yeah. So, they are looking to increase the use of recycled content. So, they, you know, no more, less virgin plastic Mm. and using recycled plastic. So, they will support industries that use recycled goods. Yeah. Which is great. So subsidies there. Um, $60 million will be invested into additional recycling infrastructure. So, yeah, we're always worried that 
the rubbish that we're putting in the recycle bin isn't getting recycled and a lot of the time it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. Sometimes it falls off the truck. Sometimes they're over facili- like they're overflowing. Mm. So this is to build up the infrastructure for waste and recycling. Yeah. So to help out a little bit there. Look, I yep. still don't think we're going to master that, but it's a step and we'll start. I appreciate the 60 million. Mm. We'll take it. I've got nothing left on Labor's uh, yeah, regime. I'm done. Um, I just want to note that with the Great Barrier Reef, because because we do love it, we want to give special attention to it. Um, you mentioned the six hundred thousand jobs with the electric uh, battery component mm-hmm. of their plan. Now, the investment of the one point two billion hopes to create about sixty four and protect sixty four thousand jobs. So it is quite a lot. And when we're looking at tourism in Australia, they do generate a lot of income for the um, residents of Queensland. So really they're looking to generate about $6.4 billion a year in tourism dollars simply from the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, it does. It, it keeps that economy alive. And, you know, we know during COVID nothing was happening. Mm. We When we went, when did we go? October 2021, yeah. shops were closing just because they could not sustain. Yeah, just oh, everywhere shops closed. So mm. I'm really stoked with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's um it's very important. It's good to keep us now educated on what we can expect so you can help us in keeping the government accountable for what they have promised. This is the promises that they made coming up to the election to secure votes from the Australian citizens. That's it. This is what they need to be held to account to. Um, and I think we need to give very little room, wiggle room here. It's this is oh, what he said. This is it. It's not it's not uh, grade one anymore. This is the real world, and yeah. you know, especially the state of the climate change. We need action now. Maybe we should try and find Anthony's email address. Yeah, come on, Albo, come yeah. on the show, <laughs> come on. Monkeypox. If you're alive on this planet, you've probably heard of it. <laughs> Just cut me out laughing. I don't think I can. I'm going to keep it in there. Maybe you liked my headline, maybe you didn't. So let's give a quick one-on-one. So I learned quite a fair bit and nothing really is surprising surprising about it. Um, it's kind of what we would expect. So there's two strains. The Congo strain, which is the more severe one, is the one you don't want to get, 10% mortality. And then we've got the West Africa strain, which is about 1% fatality. Okay. So the cases that we found mainly around the UK, for example, as West Africa strain. So not not the fatal one, which is good. So it's a zoonotic disease, as we can assume. And I'm guessing most people know where it comes from. So it does originate from monkeys. It does originate from monkeys, okay. correct. So the first confirmed human case was in 1970. Yeah, I did read that it's been circling for like 40 years. Mm, so how is it just now getting out? Well, it is very interesting. It's, it's very different and it comes in cycles and waves. So the name monkeypox, just to give a bit more of a brief history before we get into it. So the name monkeypox comes from the first documented case of illness in animals in 1958. So that was actually occurred in monkeys that they had kept for researching purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, the virus did not at that stage jump from monkeys to humans, um, nor are any monkey really major carriers of the disease. So they first found it in monkeys, but most of it was actually mainly endemic in rodents. Right. So just found it in monkeys. So it could be originating from rodents. We don't know this yet. So the transmission of monkeypox is usually directly direct contact with an infected animal or possibly by eating poorly cooked meat from an infected rodent or monkey. Um, These particular ones, they're not like the cases that are out there from the research I've done, they couldn't really link it to the consumption of the food, okay. um, which I was kind of expecting it to be with a name like monkey pox. So a big misconception is that it's like the mad cow disease, like um, Ebola, like um, the one Bird that flu. SIRS. So ones like these, different, different strains. So the monkey pox is very much like smallpox. So you just need a jab from the vaccine. Smallpox vaccine have been proved pretty effective to it because they're in the same family. Okay. That's it. 
So, so if you're already vaccinated, you're likely to be okay. Likely to be fine. Which most people, I would say, mm-hmm. would be vaccinated but with remember, these pops. vaccines happened in, what, the 1970s. So now we've got a new generation that haven't got any of the vaccine in them. So Why? that's They would have been vaccinated. Some haven't. So there is a new generation that, that opts not to get it. So remember, now parents can choose whether or not to vaccine their kids. No, didn't know that. Yeah, so parents can choose, especially in places like the States, yeah. UK, Europe, not compulsory. I think in Australia it is compulsory for your child to get smallpox at least. Um, not 100% certain on that. I'm not. Yeah. I'm definitely yeah, not an expert really on know. zoonotic diseases. Um, but I want to read some pretty solid food for thought from this Guardian article written by John Vidal. Um, it has some pretty powerful claims that I found very good um, to just ponder about. So the title is, Monkeypox isn't the disease we should be worried about. Uh-huh. So in the past, and, and this is all in quotes, so I'll, I'll just read from this article here. In the past three weeks, there have been nearly 100 cases and 18 human deaths from a rare tick-borne disease in Iraq. A fourth case of Ebola virus and more than 100 cases of the bubonic plague in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And just two years after Africa was declared Free of wild polio, new cases have turned up in Malawi and Mozambique. A dangerous strain of typhus is circulating in Nepal, India and China. There are alarming outbreaks on several continents of mosquito diseases such as malaria, dengue and West Nile virus. Set against the global context, the so very far limiting monkeypox outbreaks that have started to appear in the last month, including 71 cases detected in the UK, are only remarkable because they are reported in rich countries. Mm-hmm. We've got something with a low mortality rate, barely any cases. Well, 10% maximum, and that's not even the strain. We've got the 1%. Yeah. Very I found sad. it very fascinating to bring up race again because mm. a lot of times it is you know we don't think about the starving or we choose not to think about the fact that more people are dying from hunger from hunger all the time yeah all the millions um so in the article itself it also said disease ecologists say that nothing increases the risk of a crossover of a pathogen from one species to another like the uncontrolled expansion of farming and the exploitations by humans of wild species. So again, what we kind of know about or what we've learned about COVID. Yeah. So that's really all I have on monkeypox. Well, I did some reading as well. And I I don't know how true this is, but I was reading that it's been passed human to human by sexual intercourse. Did you read that? I'm not sure if it was true. Fascinating. It is. It mm. actually, um, gay men have had a lot of it really? in particular because there was an outbreak. That's so, I know. So annoying that it is. Because, and it said, I think it was the WHO, WHO website, the World mm. Health Organization that had it because those 40 cases in Spain all linked to this sauna. Right. In, in I think it was Barcelona where it's, it's a gay sauna and okay. a lot of them were having sexual intercourse in there. And so it transferred and to all of them. So, um, but we can't just say it, it wasn't. It's not just gay. It's not a. It's not it's a gay not, disease. No. And that's. And it said straight after it said that. Um, it was so funny. I think it was on the Who website. Just clarifying, this is not an STD. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it it was very clear and specific. But I think there's other ways of passing it through, like open just skin. wounds. Yes. Yeah. Open wounds, yeah. skin. It just they happen to have a lot of contact, and that one guy happened to go to Nigeria. <laughs> Like it was just, chances. it was, it was just super unlucky for those forty lads. Um, but yeah, that's right. There is mainly it's open wounds that they can transfer yeah. through to, but even skin contact. Um, oh, okay. It, it is possible, um, depending on your but sensitivities. But it's not airborne, is it? I don't believe it's airborne. Mm. I didn't check that far in, but I don't believe it's airborne. I think it actually has to be touching, eating. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I found this article very fascinating because it's it's something that we're just scared you know oh for sure we're super scared new virus Our oh my god world got turned upside down and we just don't want that to happen again mm-hmm. but it's such a selfish way of looking at it because these countries are dealing with much so worse. much worse and we're just worried about having to stay at home for a week mm. yeah yeah 
Yeah, it's fat. Yeah, it's very fascinating, and I'm glad I did my research because again, coming into this, I had my own bias. We both thought like, surely someone's eaten monkeys yes. again, and one of those ones, but it, it really wasn't. Although some some of it might have eaten, and it is possible to get it from eating a rodent or or a monkey that has the disease, but it's not primarily the way you would get it. So, I want to remind people like me out there who who have these biases and they mm. and, and don't go out talking before you've done your research. I've done my research now. I can say what it is, what it isn't, and it, it's you know it's intensified, of course, by our absolute disgraceful treatment of these wild species. And there's no way to know what the origin of this virus was. Could have been us doing something. But, um, yeah, definitely important to catch ourselves in our biases and doing research before we... um Make any comments. Make any comments. <laughs> That's right. What else have you got for us? I've got a random news story, which is uh, pretty cool. Have you got a random news story for us today? Mm-mm. All right. Lucky me. I get to smash it. So this is actually really, really fascinating. Um, I did a fair bit of research here. And it, it's headline actually... Headline us. He- I can headline you. It's officially time to review the Australian Dietary Guidelines that was last amended in 2013. Wow. Wow, indeed. I'm so excited. I'm very excited. So the Australian government has announced that it will provide $2.5 million. So nothing compares to the funds we're talking about, like Great Barrier Reef and stuff, but it's, it's still a decent amount. So this is going to the National Health and Medical Research Council to review the 2013 Australian Dietary Guidelines. So I'm just going to keep word vomiting, and if you have something to add, go for it. So the review will ensure the guidelines remain a trusted resource by considering the best and most recent scientific evidence. So this is where I started thinking, and and this was sent to me again by by someone on Instagram, and we know that certain industries support these guidelines. So in the US and even in Australia, we've got the dairy industry, the egg industry, the cattle industry. Unfortunately, the broccoli industry is not on there. Yeah. <laughs> these powerful industries have a say. They sit on these boards. Um, so I'm very excited to have it funded by the government. Yeah. So if someone wants more sponsors, they can. I don't. I think there's a committee they can be on. Uh, actually, my research, I don't think you can sponsor it or support it. I think it's mainly just the government there, which That's great. I'm very excited about. And I could be wrong. I, I couldn't find something on their website saying they have additional sponsors. And what you just said there, it'll be about... Recent scientific... Correct. Recent scientific findings? Like, because normally there's, what, seven-year delay? Mm -hmm. This is current best available research, 2022. That's great. Correct. So what's happening... So doctors aren't able to freaking get on board with current research. This is now. But this is now. This can. This can, absolutely. Not that... I I hope doctors can, can go across this and that gets sent out on a wide... I'm sure it'll be published by, you know, the ABC Guardian, the Australian, all, all of them, they're going to get across it. So I hope doctors do see it. Um, now, what's really cool about this, this is really exciting. So this time we'll see exactly who had a say in where. So the National Health and Medical Research Council will refer to them as NHMRC, so I don't have to pronounce the whole thing the whole time. So they're going to publish a communication log which summarizes all meetings correspondence, phone calls relating to the review of the guidelines. This means every time someone sends you an email, they note it down. Wow. What they said, who it was from, what it was regarding to, and if they responded, and what did they say if they responded. So it's in a table that's on the website. This is incredibly beautiful. I'm super stoked with this, right? You can tell. (laughs) How transparent. Super transparent. So the communication log will recall record all those things. Now, I, just to preface, I did send them an email to see if I can submit some request of some scientific um, information to be considered. Because um, they did say they will actually give all interested parties the opportunity to contribute to the review. Wow. So their needs and perspectives can be considered. So I took that on board. I emailed <laughs> them. Now, I wish I read the table before I had emailed because some people just emailed blank stuff. So I might just quickly send them another email in the coming days, just send them a few like metadata analysis reviews. Yeah. Don't ask for RCTs. permission. Just, no, just do it. I'm just going to do it. That's right. So um, the consultation opportunities included like contributing, submitting scientific advice, and participating in targeted public consultations. So actually consulting with them. So the process actually started two years ago. Believe it or not. So it's going to take four years. Wow. We're now in the stage where we're collating the evidence. And then by the second quarter of 2024, we'll have the final guideline. Cool. Very excited. So this this means it'll be just over 10 years between the guidelines. 
I'm not sure if that's ridiculous or if that's normal with in line with what other countries do. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you kind of think guidelines shouldn't change, should they? They should just be guidelines. They should. I think they should generally stay the same with yeah. slight altercations with, yeah. with scientific evidence. But saying that, we don't know how corrupt it was prior. Correct. So now there's no corruption. You'd think they'd be able to get this right and then wouldn't need many alterations in the future. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely see. So yeah, That's the skeptic in me. <laughs> everyone can go on to their website and read it if they do find it interesting. So I've read one communication log, read the whole thing, which it wasn't actually that long, which I, surpri- which I was surprised by. So the fir- one of the first people to communicate to them was a guy named Peter Strauss who actually advocated for a plant-based diet. Um, I had to jump through a few pages to actually figure that out, which was I, I don't good and bad because you don't know what the agenda is until you're actually quite deep into it. Um, so next up was Tracy Black, who also provided information on vegan diets. Wow. Um, I was a bit iffy. I'm like, vegan diet? She specifically mentioned that not whole foods plant-based, yes. which is what we want in the guidelines. We yeah, don't definitely. want Impossible Burgers in there. No. We want lentils, beans, etc. We love Impossible Burger, but, you know. Yeah, correct. <laughs> now, you ready for the juicy part? Tell us. The first industry contact. Didn't take very long from the from the first ones, but Melissa Cameron, Dairy Australia. She requested a face-to-face meeting to provide an introduction to Dairy Australia and how we can support the guideline review process. (laughs) They didn't respond. (laughs) She then sent a follow-up request four days later. Mm -hmm. So that, that's as far as I got. I don't, I don't forgot to uh, read if they responded or not, but that's the first one. All right. So here we go. Then a bunch of individuals and foundations started submitting stuff and offering help. So this wasn't, I, I found that it was quite stable within some people offering a bit of that, bit of that. So Diabetes Australia, Cancer Council, Heart Foundation, they all wanted to chip in and they didn't say, we want to submit this information. They said, if there's any way we can help you, let, let us, us know, know with resources, contacts. Now that could be their way. I'm not sure if they have resources that are skewed one way or another, Yeah. but it seemed like a lot of people were quite open to offer help, which I'm, again, quite happy with. So this is the juice of the juice. John McKillop from the Red Meat Advisory Council, and this is in quotes, requested termination of Dr. Evangeline, Greek surname, appointment to the Dietary Guidelines Expert Committee based on publication of articles which provide information on how to get the nutrients you need without eating as much red meat. End quote. So it's obviously not happy happy with her recommendations that we should stop eating as much red meat as mm-hmm. we can. I didn't see any communication with her, period, total. So she does some work with, um, I don't know if I know it down here, but I think it was like the University of Adelaide or, or in South Australia. Uh, I found I found that super uh, funny. But their response was even better. Oh, tell us. So, in quotes, we informed the Red Meat Advisory Council that the government's committee advised that the assessment risk of conflict of interest from Dr. Evangeline, her conflict of interest remains low, given that she has no financial ties that may compromise her permission, her position on the expert committee and has publicly expressed a diversity of views about her academic area of work. Based on this evidence, there was no change to her appointment. End quote. Love that. Boom. Shut down, mic drop. And I took a screenshot of of that particular thing and I, I tweeted at her. <laughs> and I said, classic, you were the first one to get attacked. And I think she found it entertaining because she followed. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, but that's, so, that's the end of Communication Long Wild. And so I'm very excited of the prospect that the fact that they publicly said no to an industry. Mm, that's excellent. Yeah. So I... <laughs> I might be holding out too much hope, but yeah. yeah, I am. I am excited. That is a good news story. Is it a good news story? I think it was. Okay. Let's get into the actual other good news stories. No, I think let's go first. Let's get into the sustainable tip. Tell us what your sustainability tip is. Get yourself a bread bag. <laughs> that is my sustainability tip. You don't want to buy. If you don't want to buy a bread bag. Mm-hmm. Just go to your bakery with a tea towel. Yeah. 
because it, it's so easy to just wrap around. You can actually use a thin cloth. And I'm looking right next to you. If you hold that up, actually, to the camera. It's still got bread in it. It's still got bread in it. We just have this thin cloth and bring out the bread. We've got some oh. rye sourdough. No, we don't need it. It's not a show on <laughs> Uh, it kind of is though. Um, so this is just it smells a, delicious. It's green and kind. So we would have got that from Flora and Fauna. Yes. It's just a thin cotton bag. Like you could use that for virtually anything. And we there just, are specific bread bags. This yeah. is just uh, like for anything. So spinach. Yeah. Green we beans. put green beans in it yeah. often. We could just Brussels sprouts. Apples. Yeah. Anything you want in this. Seriously. But yeah, we've today we've used this as our bread, bread bag. We just went to the IGA here in in Ayers Rock. Um, Yulana, I think the town's called, and we just walked in and we just put the bread in the bag and the, the lady at the checkout didn't even say anything. No, she, like, she, she knew was... it was bread, she, not a problem yeah, at all. Yeah, nonchalant. So, yeah, I think this is a really easy way to tackle a, something that's quite hard to avoid, which yeah. is the plastic and bread. So if you go to the shops, if we go to the supermarket, like our Coles and Woolies, um, or Woolworths, should I say, we have this plastic bag, which, yes, we can take back to soft plastic to recycle to be turned into park benches or whatever they want to process that to. And then we've got this bread clip, which is even harder, and that decomposes. That's what gets stuck into the microplastics, so we don't want that. When possible, my sustainability tip is getting a bread bag or, or a tea towel. Tea, everyone has a tea towel sure. or a thin lined cloth um, bag. Go into a bakery, like in yeah. Australia, Brumbies, Baker's Delight, heaps of like your local bakery, support local. And yep. you can just take this in it. Can we have it in a paper bag even? Yeah, That's paper recyclable. bag is the second option. That's the second option. Because paper is obviously better than plastic, but it's still not as good as a reusable Nothing. bag. Yeah, paper still takes, emits carbon dioxide Correct. to create. You have to recycle to it still. Um, and also, like, I know I always used to want to get plastic because the bread lasts longer in the plastic. Mm. So just get a half a loaf. Baker's Delight will give you a half a loaf. Yeah. Cheaper. Your, your bread won't go off. Yeah. And no greenhouse gases there. 100%. I feel so bad. Sometimes we talk in very Australian terms, like Baker's Delight and Brumbies for the international people. I'm sorry. Your, your, your bakery of equivalent value. Bakery a, of choice. Bakery of choice. Um, we'll start to just say bakery instead of brands um, or companies just to but not give them But I don't know that plug. any other bakery will do that, surely. I- I'm thinking 100%. I'm thinking who's, especially if you're a local bakery, mm. who, you're going to turn down business? Are you serious? No, yeah. no. It's time for our good, good news stories. only got two so you go there was a piece of news that you mentioned last year actually and one of our listeners Rayleigh sent through an article that's a follow-up on that so I was I, I shared this with you last week I think it was and you talked about WA wanting to Western Australia wanting to conserve more national forests and end logging by 2024 again at this stage it was an empty promise yep. when you said it so well it's in motion and most businesses thought it would be business as usual until the end of 2023 so they can double down until then yeah of course but nope how good yeah wa said yeah we have 50 million dollars this is our budget this is to help workers and they're stopping business now wow the main mob that is upset i'm sure you can guess the forestry lobbying group yep (laughs) forest industries federation western australia yeah with a cheek Chief Executive Officer Adele Farini said it was extremely disappointing. Sorry, love. Yep. Sorry, love. It's free. And I went on a rant after I actually really sent this to me. I'm like, it's, this is free market. This is this is capitalism. You want a capitalistic system where you can run your free business without a dictator raining down on you? This is free market. If you're contributing to a company that's destroying the climate and you see oh, what decided the vote in Australia? Climate change. Oh, wait, we're contributing to non-climate change related things. Come on. If you want to make money, you have to be prepared to lose money. Mm-hmm. And that's a sum up of my rant. <laughs> but this is great news. It is good news. And yeah, like you said, generally companies will double down up until that 2020, uh, 20, was it 2024? 2024, yeah. And just then kind of slowly decline in what, the last six months or something? Yeah. But now it's going a slow decline, but it's actually rapid. 
Very, Good. yeah. I'm really happy that they're also supporting the workers. What we were talking on before, yes. they're not just like, this logging industry is now dying, that's it. Done. It's They're using that $50 million to retrain their workers, pay their way, pay them off. Likely to go into renewables or something, hopefully. We need those technicians. We need people who understand the craft and can work in a physical environment to, to help support this transition to renewable energy. But my second good news story, which is even more exciting, has got to do with this one, okay. kind of. Okay. So you think logging. It's obviously bad, but what is the impact of climate change of logging? Obviously varies. Here's this title. Tasmania has gone carbon negative. Really? Not carbon neutral, carbon negative. I'm surprised. They sequester officially more carbon the name it. Wow. Believe it or not. So how did they do this? By well, reducing their logging. Yeah, okay. Great. How insane is that? So Griffith University researcher Brendan McKay came out and said, the mitigation benefit is about 22 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. 22 million tonnes. That's that's like half of Chevron in Western Australia. That the One of the biggest oil... Um, producing companies WA, I think I think they do forty million metric tons. So this is half sequestering just in one small island state. Well done. See, I'm always hearing SA is doing really great, and they are, but they're not ca- carbon negative. That's, yeah, that's... there's there's very few places. I think Tasmania is one of the obviously it's a little place it to is. put into perspective. It is a little place. There's, I would say there's very little farming. Mm. done in Tasmania. We know there's salmon farms and things like that going on there. Um, But, yeah, great. Tassie. We love Tassie. Yeah, we do love Tassie. And I'm not going to go on a rant about those fishing farms, which I'm just going to make a reel (laughs) about to post tomorrow morning. Yes. Um, But Tasmania already had a pretty low emission profile since the state's electricity larger comes from, guess what? Renewables. Hydro energy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, which we actually did see a lot of driving past. We saw lots of hydro power plants. Yeah. um, it was probably the main. I don't know if I saw. Did we see any fracking there? Not that I can recall. Yeah, no. I can't recall any. But we would have seen like maybe three or four huge hydro power stations. Mm. One in a national forest. One just in this random part. And it, the people there all worked there. That was just that's what gave them jobs and that supported yeah. their local economy. So claps to Tassie. Big claps to Tassie. Take us away with a good news story. Well, we've been talking about grilled for a while. Oh, I'm craving grilled. I don't know why. <laughs> we're just dying for a grilled burger. It's been a while. We, we usually cook by ourselves while we're traveling mm. and we don't get the normal fast food, unhealthy stuff, which is a blessing. Yes. But still got Not those Not that we cravings. have it too often yeah. or that no, often we at all. I haven't had grilled in months, yeah, maybe months. even a year. Like. Actually, I think it was when grilled stopped with their meat li- mm. um, meat-free Mondays. Yeah. So... Firstly, Meat Free Mondays are back, guys. Yeah. Which we knew. This has been back mm. for a little while. But if anyone doesn't know, Meat Free Mondays are buy one, get one free burgers. That are As vegan. long as it's vegetarian. Yeah, as long as it's got no meat. Yeah. Which is a fantastic initiative oh, by a company. Amazing. And if you buy on Tuesdays, I think it's still happening. Plant a tree. Yeah, they plant yeah. a tree for every burger sold. So if you're going to go to Grilled, go on a Monday or a Tuesday. But Same anyway, yep. into my good news story. Mm. Grilled... They have two full vegetarian restaurants. What? Is the word I was looking for. As if. Collingwood Grilled. and Darlinghurst, New South oh, Wales. We have to go to Collingwood then. We have to go to Collingwood. What do you mean it's fully? So they're fully only, vegetarian. Is the menu still like the eight burgers? Or? The ma- menu's massive. Shut 23 up. 23 plant based burgers. Oh my God. As well as salads and sides. They are renamed as Impossibly Grilled. Okay, this is not an ad for grilled, no. by the way. We're just excited about burgers sometimes. <laughs> we do love grilled. So Impossibly Grilled actually started in the US in 2011. Oh, it's so grilled th- in the US as well? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. I mm. thought they were just Australian. No. Well, apparently not. Okay. So cool. it's really great to see that it expanded here. So 10 of the burgers on the menu are Impossible Burgers. They also have Fable on the menu, so cool. the mushroom meat. Yep. Um, yeah. 
This seems like an ad for Grilled, but what it really <laughs> is, is they started a few years ago with three burgers that were vegetarian. Mm-hmm. There was a mushroom burger, like a veggie, like your pea veggie patty. Yeah. And I think, I think that might have been even it. And, and now, then they expanded to Beyond. They had Beyond and now Impossible and now a fully vegetarian. And here we are thinking, or some people think vegetarians don't make a difference or vegans don't make a difference. And That's exactly what I wanted to say as well. Like, we, we love going out to eat at mm. just fully vegan places. We love it, don't yeah, we? We don't we have do. to worry about the menu. We don't have to worry about getting cheese by accident, accident. and you have to turn it around and you're wasting the food yeah, yeah and then looking that. at the impossible burger going oh it looks is a this bit actually red. me like yep. we don't know so we, we you know we do want to advocate for those places that are really trying mm. we want to show that there is um demand we want to show that these fast food places actually have the demand for vegan and vegetarian options because mm. there is a demand. Huge demand. So don't shy away just because these places are non-vegan as well. We want to show that we can make a difference and we are. Mm. You've just maybe pissed off a lot of people by saying that. Because <laughs> a lot of people say they won't support these vegan because they cook in the oil. And I yeah. think I think grilled even washes or uses it. I think they have a separate grill. Yeah, I think they do as well. But, but of course, chips and stuff. Yeah. Well, 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 they chips. have like deep fried chicken, don't they? I'm not sure. Yeah. Had their healthy chicken, remember? Yeah, look, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> their carbon, carbon-free chicken or something well, it was on their menu. Like, just healthy chicken. Was it healthy mm-hmm. chicken? Yeah, right. We had a good laugh at that. Yeah. Like, nah, nah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I agree. Like, I, I think I've had a f- few arguments in my time with other vegans saying you shouldn't eat out at non-vegan places. You want to support vegan places, which we do. Oh, absolutely. And and I love it in a, in a lot of ways, but mm. I have we have to vote with yeah. our dollar yep. for, for other places because a fully vegetarian restaurant... You know it's, who I, it's doing something. And mm. Hungry Jack's had a fully vegetarian restaurant yeah. for a while. I think it was In a pop Spain up or something. Yeah. yeah, and London. I think it was a pop up, but it, it's showing that it's there's demand for it. Hundred percent. You know who I want to see at one of these grilled? Tully. Who? Shaquille O'Neal. Why? He's gone vegan. Has he? Shaquille O'Neal, this seven foot oh, one monstrosity of a beast. Is no longer consuming animal products. Wow! This is this is Shaq has become one of the biggest icons of our time. Mm. From becoming, I can just think his hand is would, like would like <laughs> slap your whole body. <laughs> yes, um, he he's become a huge icon. He's become a meme. He, he's become a an entrepreneurial mogul. He just does everything. So we, the fact that he's vegan is honestly in my mind some of the best yeah. news. Maybe we mentioned this whole time because his reach is incredible. Yeah. His reach is absolutely monstrous. Now, he owns multiple Papa John's, Aunt Auntie Anne's, Krispy Kremes. Okay. has heaps of restaurants. So now you're going American. You're amazing the Americans because I don't know these places. This is what he owns. Yeah, I know. I only know Krispy Kreme yeah. and I've heard of Papa John's. I don't You've know heard what they... Of it? I've heard I have no idea what they sell. I'm sorry. Um, but there was in an interview he tells this... This this fella, he doesn't eat the junk food at those restaurants, so he's ditching at his, his own restaurants. at his own restaurants, and he's he said, and I quote, "Eating a plant based diet is the best thing you can do for your health, the environment, and the animals." You so, are right, my Shaq, friend, my boy. Time to come on the podcast. Let's <laughs> chat. I I wonder how many calories he eats in a day. Oh my, he'd be eating constantly. Like <laughs> I, I just don't know like how much, f- if he was eating plant-based, like even whole foods plant-based, he'd be smashing like 200 grams of fiber a day to, I just don't understand. Does he have bigger plates than normal people? Surely. I, I don't, well, I don't yeah, know. His hand would just crush it. Like. Yeah. Well, he, um, you know, I think he is actually vegan. I'm using that word in particular, not plant-based, because he said in this interview, whenever I feel like cheating, I go to this restaurant. I think it was like Massachusetts called the Slutty Vegan, okay. which I'd heard before. I've seen their menu and burgers there look incredible. Yeah, right. And he says, whenever I feel like cheating, I go here. So he can't. he's not just going to cheat, where someone who's plant-based or plant cures yeah. or plant-predominant could just have that burger. Yeah. But he's ethically now aligned to that lifestyle. And this story comes from a few different news articles um so i'm trusting it for now 
Of course, a lot of celebrities go back and forth. Yeah, of course. Um, and I'm not sure if his business ventures will interfere with that. But Well, let's hope one day he changes them all to be vegan. 100% or sells them and just buys out a bunch of vegan yeah. businesses and supports <laughs> that way of life. But, yeah, I'm really stoked, stoked with that. Good job. Mm-hmm. Bar Bar Black Sheep and other nursery rhymes get a makeover. Okay. <laughs> I, I understand funny. the political correctness needed in, in some of these. So yes. do you know the actual makeovers I've and what got, they've changed? I've got a couple. Yeah. So Baba ba, ba, ba Black Sheep famously starts with Baba ba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Yep. Peter's is it Peter? Am I saying Peter? Peter. Yeah. P-E-T-A. Yeah, Peter. Peter. Peter's version reads Baba ba Black Sheep. Can I have your wool? No, sir, no, so, sir, that's not cool. <laughs> that's a vibe. <laughs> yep. I like it. Yep. And then there's cool. the three blind mice, and I don't really know if I know the story behind the three no, blind mice. I don't mice. know either. Um, it's, it's pretty old school, these stories. Yeah. In three blind mice, the mice do not have their tails carved off by the farmer's wife. What? In I didn't fact, even know that happened. Me either. Okay. The new, the new lines change the plot with the mice still running after the farmer's wife, but not, but only to thank her for saving their life. Oh, cool. Small change. This is um, in quotes from Peter. Mm-hmm. Small changes like Peter's can instill empathy and compassion, since humanity is increasingly realising that animals are not ours to exploit. The songs we sing to our children, who absorb everything they see and hear, must reflect these values. 100%. Yeah. I think that would just instill, mm. like, a subconscious level. 100 Yeah. Yeah. All the farm books don't show slaughter and murder and no. those sorts of things. They they're all happy, show happy and yeah. and animal and kids love animals. Like they love visiting farms. Like yeah. it's super super cool for them. All right, oat milk production facility opens up in WA as popularity surges. I feel like I've mentioned Western Australia way too many times. <laughs> You'd think we were there. Yeah, uh, but a survey of more than nine hundred cafes found a quarter of Australians chose plant milk in 2021. The most popular option was almond followed by soy and oat. So they're opening up this almond. huge... I yeah, mean, I know. I'm surprised. Oh, I'm super shocked and wow. Um, <laughs> but this huge oat milk facility is opening up. And so a cafe analyst over there, Sean Edwards, which what is a cafe analyst, firstly? <laughs> How do I get that job? How do I get job? that job? Yeah, absolutely. He said two years ago, oat milk was at 0.2%. Can you even guess what it's out now? I want to say in the 20s. 100%. 20%. Yes. 100%. Not 100%. Not 100%, but 100 20%. 20%. 20%. Yeah, so this is this is awesome news. Yeah, huge. Yep. That, that's my good news story, nice I'm going to stick with soy milk, though. I'm sticking with soy, 100%. You, you love your soy. Yeah. I've tried, I think, all of them at this stage, and soy is definitely the way to go. I'm a soy boy. You <laughs> Happy, happy soy boy. Oh, yes. Um, have you got anything else for us? I haven't. Have you? I have a fun fact to end the episode, Please. if I can. Yeah. And this is for those that think that just making a simple change or one person can't make a change. They can. Switching to plant-based twice a week is the equivalent to planting 13.88 billion trees. You can make it. Thirteen point eight eight billion. That's a lot of trees That's for two days a week. Mm -hmm. My goodness, six meals. Wow. If you're not eating plant based two days a week, people, come on. Come on. Come on. Let your get your plant paradigm on. But you also don't have to do it two days. You can just do six meals across the mm. whole. I don't even know one meal, just one meal a day, plant based. One yeah. plant based choice a day, pretty much. Yeah, good one. Awesome. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. What a beautiful way to end this episode as we hit just over an hour and a half. So lovely way for people to listen to us on their commute or wherever else they listen to. So here's another friendly reminder to leave a review. If you found this episode helpful, inspiring, 
Um, sorry that it had a very big Australian focus. It's definitely something that we see through our lens quite a bit because we're Australian. Yes. Um, but the next few episodes, I think you guys will really enjoy. So next one is with our good friends, Ross and Ramona Hedefin. Oh. So this lovely old couple in Port Melbourne, and it's all about plastic. So it's coming out next week. Um, highly recommend it. It was in person, so the quality is nice. They're so sweet and passionate. It's so Super lovely. Passionate. Tears were had oh, in that episode. Yeah. Tears were had. Um, yeah, so that's coming out next week. All about plastic, if you guys want to listen to that. And then after that, we have Dominique, who is all about vegan luxury. So we're talking fashion, alternative schooling systems, so homeschooling, um, and different democratic democratic ways of schooling which is something i hadn't heard of before so that'd be a really cool episode and so many more to come awesome thanks for joining us thanks for joining us and until next time stay happy eat plants peace